Well, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Zittrain, and on behalf of the Harvard Law School's um, library, the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, the Safra Center for Ethics, the Center for Public Leadership, and any other center or organization I have left out <laughs> inadvertently, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the, what will be an extraordinary conversation between David Gergen and Larry Lessig. A few uh, brief uh, observations of the logistical sort. Um, the webcast for this event is at bit.ly slash Republic Lost HLS, but then again, if you're here, you don't need the webcast, and if you're on the webcast, you already know that. <laughs> um, the hashtag for Twitter, however, which will be useful to everybody, is hash Republic Lost. We got the registration for that early. And uh, this is being webcast and recorded, so if anybody here objects to that, uh, you should draw away and cover your face. Um, Thank you to the Safra Center for the refreshments. There appears to be a cookie with chocolate and uh, delicious coffee and tea, so thank you for that. Were you scowling at the nature of the food or? The nature of the, the food. Nature yes. of the food. Um, also, Larry's book, Republic Lost, is available uh, afterwards uh, right outside, and Larry will be signing will, his book, yeah. which greatly increases its value. <laughs> so thank you for that, Larry. And you, you will do personalized signatures as well. For everybody except you. Yes, <laughs> That's extremely disappointing. Um, so, okay, with those logistical notes uh, out, we are planning to have a conversation uh, between David and Larry. It'll go for about 45 minutes. Then we'll leave probably about 15 minutes for questions. We have a hard stop at 6 p.m., after which we can mingle uh, informally. So uh, David Gergen, who will be uh, leading the uh, conversation with Larry, has been an advisor to over 42 presidents. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded incredible at first, didn't it's it? It's not true. It's not true. I started with Grover Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Four of them presidents of the United States. The rest of them, either presidents to be or other sorts of leaders. Uh, in fact, he uh, is the head of the Center for Public Leadership, uh, teaches uh, over at the Kennedy School, and uh, you may have seen him early and often on CNN. Uh, author of several books, incredible uh, fellow who has been thinking a lot about uh, the general state our country is in and how to make it better. And speaking of that, Larry Lessig has been thinking about that as well. He's been a professor at the University of Chicago, Stanford, Harvard. Uh, he's been a wonderful colleague and friend over many years. He has taken on a number of causes. Some of them have worked out better than others. Uh, <laughs> but this is the one to top them all. Uh, and in fact, uh, as you'll soon hear, he's described some of the problems that he's working on now as really the root problems of some of the earlier problems he was working on in the cyber law and in other contexts, um, almost all of which have to do with bringing people together who might otherwise be thinking they are disagreeing. That's a lot of Larry's academic work showing the hidden variable where disagreeing people might agree. And as I think you're about to hear, it's a lot of what he's thinking about now. So with no further ado, let me turn it over to David Gergen and to Larry Lessig. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very, very much. I, I take it you were looking askance at the uh, cookies, too much high fructose Absolutely. corn syrup? Absolutely. Absolutely. All they did it as a joke. They, What's that? They did it as a joke, the Saffir Center. They know I hate that food. Yeah. I see. The corruption of Washington <laughs> creeps into our midst. Well, let me just first of all say the uh, I want to recommend this book to you without reservation. It is, it is a terrific read. Uh, I'm, I will confess to you I'm still in the midst of it, uh, but it is a terrific read. It is written with the analytical power of the law school, the pa passion of the Kennedy School, and, uh, and, and, and the uh, writing of some English departments, not all English departments <laughs> across the country. Um, but congratulations, uh, you should be very proud of this work. It is, uh, you've given offense both to left and right, which is uh, <laughs> also uh, uh, an accomplishment. Tell us your main, the main argument here, so let's cut right to the chase. Well, I, 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 you know, I, this, this, is a, this is a subject that's been debated and discussed for as long as there's been government. So I wanted to try to move the debate along a little bit, and I want to move it along in, two critical ways. The one is to characterize the kind of corruption that's going on here. Um, the Supreme Court talks as if the only corruption that there is is a kind of Rob Lagojevich corruption, quid pro quo corruption. Um, and, and in my view, that has nothing to do with the kind of corruption that 
infects Congress. This is the cleanest Congress in the history of Congress from that perspective. Instead, the kind of corruption that we've got here is not a corruption of bad souls, but it's really good souls operating within a system that drives them perpetually to pay attention to what their funders want as they spend 30 to 70% of their time raising money from funders. And obviously, and as all of us would be, in that context, slowly losing sight of what the people want. So if the framers envisioned a republic by which they meant a representative democracy, by which Federalist 52 said would be a government dependent upon the people alone. We now have a government dependent upon the people and the funders, or more like the people and the funders. And the problem with that is the funders are not the people. So that conflict is, I want to say, a kind of corruption. And you call it a, a dependence corruption. Dependence corruption, right. right. And you make the point that we have had at least one period of serious corruption in the country in the late 19th century, but it was different in nature. That's right. Uh, Gilded Age corruption was plain old, old style, fun, bribery kind of corruption. It was, uh, you know, Congress was a cesspool of this kind of corruption. And through much of the 20th century, members of Congress had safes in their office. And you think, oh, geez, I didn't know they paid congressmen in cash. They didn't. Just turned out there was bags of cash on their desk that they had to find a safe place for. Yeah. So that kind of corruption was our past. And it's almost the unintended consequence of the reformist movement to get rid of that corruption yeah. that it engendered the need to produce a different kind of corruption, one that's in plain sight, completely legal, completely ethical, according to our current right. judgments. Well, we, have, we still have episodes of the other. I, I, I worked in an administration with someone called Spiro, pass the ba bags, please, Agnew. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so that hasn't gone completely away. Uh, but this other dependence corruption is very interesting. It's, you call it corruption and you think it's uh, corrosive uh, for two reasons. One, of the dependence, and another, because of what it does to the trust in government. I, those, those are your That's right. So, central. so the standard way members of Congress respond to this is, amazingly, insisting that the life spending 30 to 70% of their time raising money has no effect on them, it doesn't change what they do. And so the first response is, to that is, OK, let's assume that's right. Let's assume you're a superhuman the only humans in the world who are not affected by reciprocity arrangements and not affected by the kind of influence that we ordinary humans right. suffer all the time. Let's assume that. Still, 75% of Americans believe money buys results in Congress. You know, a little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you when the Republicans uh, were in the minority, it was more Republicans than Democrats. So whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths, here is the one thing we all agree about. Money buys results in Congress, and that, leads, I suggest, to extraordinary lack of confidence in this institution. You know, the latest CBS uh, New York Times poll found 9% of Americans with confidence in this institution. Yeah. But let's go to the question of why it is more extensive now in your judgment than it has been. I mean, after all, Madison wrote about this in the Federalist Papers, and he basically argued that the system was set up to have interest cancel interest or interest compete against and not be able to dominate. Another yeah, so, so since Madison formalized with Manker Olson, we've had this problem of the uh, logic of collective action that's going to create factions that right. Madison had, I think, a naively hopeful view that these factions would cancel each other out. But that fire has now had fuel poured upon it because of a second dimension in the game that members of Congress have to play, which is the fundraising dimension. And that fundraising dimension has changed dramatically, I think we can show, in just the time since Gingrich. Um, because after Gingrich gave the Republicans control of Congress, uh, the control of Congress was, in everybody's mind, now up for grabs. And it's flipped control as often since Gingrich as it did in the 50 years before. And that means, as corporate lawyers would say, there's a control premium. And that control premium becomes um, furiously pursued by both parties as both parties are trying to raise as much money as they can to gab, grab control again. And as they raise as much money as they can, the norms of the institution change. So members of Congress who've, you know, the average member of Congress has not been there long enough even to recognize how it's changed. But you talk to members like Jim Cooper, who gave a lecture here called Fixing Congress. Um, and Cooper says, the pro who's, and he's been there all, as long as all but about 20 other members of Congress, Cooper says, Congress has become a farm league for K Street. These people are 
constantly raising money and constantly focused on their life after Congress inside the system where raising money is so valuable, which is what lobbyists increasingly do on K Street. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I was stunned by one, one uh, uh, piece of the book here about numbers. On, I, I, I understand the imperative to go out and raise more money and how Congress has shortened the work week, they go home to raise money, they constantly are doing it, in part to pay for the demands of television, how expensive sure. television is. Um, but it's but the number of people who go into lobbying so that they so given the fact that this is such an avenue now into lobbying they become they want to please and get to know the lobbyists because that may be a place of future employment listen to this from the book an important change in the 1970s three percent of retiring members of congress became lobbyists 1970s three percent 30 years later that number has increased by an order of magnitude between 1998 and 2004 more than 50% of senators and 42% of House members made that career transition. That really creates a sense of this is my future home. Yeah, that's right. And, it's, it, and the, the economics of it is very familiar to people who go to school here, right? So um, many people go to school here, they want to become uh, lawyers in big firms. So they graduate from the Harvard Law School, they go to work on Wall Street, they get paid about $180,000 a year. Six or eight years into it, they hope to become a partner and get paid half a million or more than that a year. Well, that's what members of Congress, according to Jim Cooper, increasingly do. They go to Congress, they get paid about $180,000 a year, that's their junior associate period, and then six or eight years into it, they want to graduate and become a partner. But a partner is a lobbyist on K Street making $500,000 or $700,000 a year. Now, in that world, how are you ever going to imagine the people in Congress changing the system so that those lobbyists don't actually have the power that they have. Uh, now, I'm not somebody, as you know from the book, who opposes lobbyists. I think in my utopia, there will be lobbyists. Um, but as, as, uh, as John Edwards used to say when we used to quote John Edwards, there's, there's We try all, to forget that. Yeah, OK, oh, but yeah. it was a good part of our past before we were enlightened very darkly. Um, um, there's all the difference in the world between a lawyer making an argument to a jury and a lawyer handing out $100 bills to the jurors. And the problem with our lobbying system is that it doesn't understand the difference. So um, they are both <coughs> policy wonks and they are channels through which funding happens and that makes it extremely hard for members of Congress to stand independent of them, right. especially if they want that job when they've graduated. Let's come to a concrete example, the one that I think a lot of people quote out of the book and that is about uh, uh, sugar. And, and high fructose corn syrup. Can you, you walk us through that? I, I found that quite interesting. Yeah, so, um, so the basic point is, very, the, the basic argument of this chapter is very small, which is, you know, we don't eat well. Okay, one thing we eat too much of is sweets. Of course, we eat too much fat, too, and too much salt, too, but put those things aside. Let's focus on sweets. What's interesting about the sweets we eat is they're increasingly dominated by high fructose corn syrup, a mixture which was never in our diet in 1980. No human had ever consumed it. Now 40% of the uh, products in your supermarket, or maybe not here in Cambridge, but you know, ordinary American supermarkets, um, have high fructose corn syrup in it. So what explains this extraordinary rise in high fructose corn syrup relative to sugar? Well, the answer is, on the surface, sugar is expensive relative to corn. But of course, it doesn't take far down to recognize sugar is expensive because the domestic sugar industry has secured tariffs that protect them against foreign competition, giving them about a billion dollars in extra profits and costing, um, costing uh, the economy uh, two to three billion dollars because sugar is two to three times as expensive in America as anywhere else. And high fructose corn syrup is so cheap because we subsidize the production of corn, some $75 billion in the last 15 years, leading some economists to say the cost of growing corn is negative. So if you add one and one together, you can see why um, we have a radical change in the cost of foods. So vegetables, I quote, in the period 90, uh, 98 to 2003 go up by 17%. Big Mac goes down by 5.5%. Bottle of Coke goes down by 35%. And you can also see a radical change in how food gets made. So Food Inc., the great film, describes how because corn is so cheap, it turns out it's cheaper to feed it to cattle than to have them graze on grass. Pretty good for the factory farms, not so great for the cattle, because the cattle, of course, 
don't digest corn well. It kind of stews in their seven stomachs. And as it stews, it breeds all sorts of bacteria. And as it breeds the bacteria, they have to feed it antibiotics to deal with the, the bacteria. And of course, you feed too much antibiotics. You begin to filter out the superbugs. And the superbugs, of course, increasingly make their appearance in the food we eat. Now, all of this, because of this weird way we've allowed the market to be distorted, to favor sugar and to favor corn and not favor our bodies. And of course, people in agriculture look at this and say, of course, I mean, my favorite quote was the head of Archer Daniels Midland, which of course benefits dramatically from the subsidy, who though he is an extraordinarily rich man says, you know, this is a socialist nation. Of course, this is a socialist nation. But of course, it's the dumbest form of socialism ever invented by man because we are socializing to benefit the rich. Some would say that's always what socialism does, but we're socializing to benefit the rich and not the rest of us, right? Which is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing in this country. How does one separate out? Because you, you, you make this sort of pounding argument about how corruption is driving this and driving that, and one would conclude that it's the driving force behind high fructose corn syrup and, and in turn behind obesity, but others would argue, wait a minute, it's lifestyles, it's the fact that so few families, there's so many people in now in the lower uh, working class that they wind up going to fast food restaurants 10 or 12 times a week with their kids. This is where they do their socializing. We've created a culture that's become dependent on fast food. And it's that that's really driving the obesity issue, not the subsidy and the parent tariffs. Yeah, so in this part of the book, I, I want to lay out examples where we have policies Congress has drawn and ask the question whether after I ex drop the fact of the significant money on the table, you have confidence in the policy anymore. Right. I don't want to make a claim about whether high fructose corn syrup is making us sick. I don't want to make a claim. I have a section that's gotten me a lot of trouble. There was a, there was a Washington uh, uh, bookstore that invited me to give a, 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 a reading, and then they read the chapter on teachers. And they said, no, 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 we can't have you talk because you don't say the right things about teachers. Right? So I had what said- What did you the, say it was offensive? Well, I, I, in the chapter about teachers, I said, you know, here's the fact. We've got teachers unions that have protected solidly um, teachers from certain kinds of reforms, and we have the fact of a bajillion dollars from the Democratic Party, to the Democratic Party from teachers unions. So when you look at the policy and the money, are you confident about the policy anymore? No, I don't want to make an argument that the policy is good or bad. I just want to say, are you confident about the policy? Right, so, are you telling me that they didn't invite you or they disinvited you from giving a talk at a bookstore because of I that was, argument? I had a scheduled talk. It was canceled. The reason given the publisher was about what I said about teachers. That's unbelievable. I found it unbelievable as well, but I trust my publisher not to be making up the facts. <laughs> so. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, so in all, the point is, in all of these cases, you know, it's not so much to say, I know what the right answer is, because what, what am I? I'm a lawyer, right? I don't know what the right answer is. What I, what I know is, if you tell people money is on the table, their confidence drops. So I, you know, I introduced this section by talking about two very controversial issues. One is about BPA, you know, and the other is about cell phone safety. I don't want to make any claims about whether BPA is safe or whether cell phones are safe, but when I point out that the studies showing BPA is safe divide in a very suspicious way. Industry-funded studies all say it's safe. Non-industry-funded studies overwhelmingly find a problem. Same thing in the cell phone context. The only observation is, now I have weakened your confidence in your view about the safety. And the purpose of this section is to say, government too needs to recognize that if people are not confident in what it does because of the way money has influenced, or because of even the fact of money's presence, that is a sufficient reason to want to change the way money inter interacts here because we've got to have confidence in our government. We're not going to be involved. We're not going to do what it tells us to do. We're not going to want it to do all sorts of things we need it to do if we think it's just corrupt. So even if it's not corrupt, that enough, that alone is enough to give us a reason to want to think about a different If system. you think it's rigged. If we think it's rigged, right. Which is, seems to be the common theme between the Occupy Wall Street crowd and the Tea Party crowd. Okay, so 
I completely agree with you. And I wrote this piece in the Huffington Post um, saying, you know, here's an obvious point. You want to talk about the 99%? Here's the thing 99% of Americans could really agree on. Why don't we find a way to build common ground between the Tea Party and the Occupy Wall Street movement? Not to say we all agree, because we don't. We really disagree about a bunch of fundamental issues. But here's one thing we all do agree about. So put a list together of this is what we agree, we believe, and this is what we all believe. But I published that and uh, been pummeled by people on the left. You can't talk to the Tea Party. The Tea Party's a bunch of racists. You know, and I say, OK, wait. You say you're the 99%. The latest poll from Gallup says 30% of Americans support the Tea Party. Now, I don't support the Tea Party, but 30% do. Now, I, I'm not a mathematician. I'm a lawyer. But it just doesn't <laughs> seem to add up to me, right? 30% taken away from 99% doesn't seem to leave you with 99% anymore. So if you really want to talk for 99%, speak in a way 99% could agree with. And I agree with you completely. This is the ground on which 99% ought to be able to agree. I agree. That's interesting. That's interesting. Because I found the same, I've had the same experience on a question of working with evangelicals. Uh, there are many who write off, you can't work with them. You know, they're way off there. And, uh, and, and, uh, and yet, if you sit down with Rick Warren, who is one of the leading evangelicals, on two issues he agrees with the left. On poverty? Sure. And he's become green. Yeah. Because he's into this where we ought to save the planet, you sure. know, that we're here to save God's creation. Sure. And on those you can make common ground and you can make a lot of progress. Yeah, but the terrifying thing is, you know, we live in this culture where the business model is polarization. Yeah. You know, so in this room, we had a conference about a month ago about calling a constitutional convention co-sponsored by the Tea Party Patriots. And Mark Meckler, founder of the Tea Party Patriots, gave what I think was the best speech of the weekend. And he was talking about how politicians profit from us hating each other. And we have to find a way to talk to each other, despite the fact that everybody profits from us hating each other, not just politicians, the media too. Like the Fox, MSNBC right. business model is about those guys are idiots, right? Right. Um, well, so, what about so the, politi the politicians because they can in their fundraising letters yeah. they demonize the other side, and that's the way they raise money. Save that's us right. from save us from these devils. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I was enormously excited by what what he said, um, but a week ago I got an email from him. Can we bring the heat down on the mics a little bit? Um, uh, I got a week uh, email from him. T telling me about how all of the Occupy Wall Street people were, quote, anarchists who hate America. And after he said this, the very next line was, therefore, send the Tea Party 25 or 50 or whatever you can afford dollars to help support us in our movement. Like, you know, and I thought, talk about business model of hate. What, what are you doing here? This is exactly the thing that he came here to say that um, you know, is destroying America, and I think it is. But we've got to find a way you know, e pluribus unum. We've got to find a way out of these many different groups, recognizing our diversity and recognizing our difference to see whether there's something we can build on top of. And of course, historically, we, uh, we had a very important um, incident, incidence of that, right, which was, you know, we look back to the founders, 74 men sitting in a room in Philadelphia in 1787, and we think those guys were all the same. You know, basically white men, upper class. They were radically different people. There are people who believed in slavery and people who believed slavery was the moral abomination of the age. And yet they could sit in the room together and bracket that disagreement long enough to save this republic. You know, and I think we face, problem, we face problems not as great. You know, it's not a whole constitution we need to write. It's just one thing we need to fix. And the difference between the Tea Party and the Occupy movement is nothing as compared to the difference between people who think slavery is justified and people who think it's a moral ab abomination. Mm -hmm. So I would think that we should be able to do our smaller differences for a smaller purpose, but um, I'm not yet convinced it's possible. There's so many things I want to talk to you about, and eventually we're going to talk about how do we get out of this. But I, I do want to cover a couple of other things. Um, uh, you, you in, a, in effect, argue that what the, the, this corruption that you describe actually hurts both the right and the left. There are issues the left cares about that's hurting, and there are issues the right hurts about, hurt, that get hurt. Yeah, the left is obvious. I mean, we've just seen a president who's been defeated in many areas because of issues, because of the way this operates. The right is the more important to understand, because I think unless the right and the left recognize this as a problem, nothing ever changes. Nothing in America changes until it's cross-partisan. So 
It hurts the right because let's say you're a Kane or you're a Rick Perry and you want to um, uh, simplify taxes. That is ignorant of the central way in which Congress funds a bunch of their campaign. Because in the tax system right now, we have all these temporary provisions that expire after a period of time. And they're kept temporary forever. So the first of them was the Reagan Research and Development Tax Credit, 1981. Made temporary because Reagan and the Democrats couldn't agree about whether it made sense. So Reagan said, fine, make it temporary. We'll ask the economists. The economist says it makes sense. We'll keep it. So the economists were asked after a couple of years, they, all of them, left and right, said it's brilliant, it's brilliant. It, it encourages exactly the right kind of investment. We ought to keep it. It is still temporary to this day. And why is it temporary? Well, Rebecca Kaisar, a professor in a Georgia Law Review article, sort of maps it perfectly. She says, well, these companies affected by the Research and Development Tax Credit have millions of dollars at stake. As that tax credit's about to expire, they're willing to spend unending amounts of money to make it so that Congress extends it. So Congress begins to say, oh, we're not sure we got the support to extend it. You have lobbyists calling everybody, oh, I got to get the money down there to make sure it's extended. It gets extended magically just at the last minute. It's been extended every time except once. And then the one time it wasn't extended, it was retroactively extended. So it corrected the problem of the past. Um, and so you begin to think, my god, we are taxing not just to raise revenue for our government, but we are taxing to raise revenue for the campaigns that congressmen need to wage. And so if you are a Republican who wants simpler taxes, you've got to recognize that the government has a built-in incentive against your position, because how are they going to fund their campaigns if they have simpler taxes? Right. Do you think in a similar way that, uh, that this may have distorted the health care debate and that it became a very polarized vote, in part because both sides recognized if it's polarized, the fight continues? Absolutely. Yeah, it was a great example. Um, um, Huffington Post had this piece um, asking, what was the number one issue Congress addressed in the first four months of this year? You know, we have two wars, huge budget crisis. We have no addressing of global warming. We have no, um, uh, we have lots of health care issues. So what was the number one issue they addressed? What dominated Congress, in their words? The bank swipe fee controversy. The bank swipe fee controversy, when you swipe your debit cards, does, do banks get to charge more or do retailers get to pay less? Now, why was this the number one issue Congress addressed? Well, because if you're a congressman and you act a little bit fickle or a little bit uncertain about which side you want to come down on this, millions of dollars get showered down upon you and your party. And the point that they make is, in Washington, no issue is ever dead. So this year's resolution is just the invitation right. for next year's fight. Right. And each time right. they have the fight, the $19 billion channels tons of money into the campaign. Yeah. So it's the agenda too. Tax policy, I would say, regulatory policy, and the very agenda of Congress, all driven in part by how do we raise the most money. Yeah, this is so interesting because the, the, one of the tr chief arguments you hear from CEO after CEO is, I'm not invest, I'm sitting on a lot of money in my corporation. I'm not going to invest in new jobs because I'm not certain what Washington is going to do next. And so the uncertainty that is dampening investment in jobs, what you're arguing is caused in part by the self-interest of sure. members of Congress to keep it uncertain. Sure. Because it makes it easier to raise money, of course. It's really interesting. It's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. I want to, uh, and I, 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 the issue of the banks, it, it almost could be left unsaid, but, but I think you ought to say it. Walk us through your analysis of where we are on banks here this, this many months, this years after the crisis of yeah, 07 so, 08. So of course, you know, in some sense, we should criticize the fact that the banks were able to basically buy deregulation, beginning with Clinton, um, through 2008. Right. Um, in a series of regulatory changes capped with um, the re relaxing of the Glass-Steagall separation, the banks secured not only the ability to trade assets invisibly by making it so derivatives were not traded on public exchanges and didn't have transparency requirements or anti-fraud requirements, but also that the banks could become gamblers, and they became gamblers. Um, and they gambled in a context where the Fed clearly signaled, don't worry, if things blow up, we'll back you up, producing um, another version of the dumbest form of socialism ever noted by man, where we socialize the risk and privatize the benefit. So the downside we pay, the upside they get. Okay, 
in one sense, you could say it's almost forgivable because until 2008, we lived in a zeitgeist of deregulation. Mm -hmm. um, it was like everybody thought deregulation made sense. And Congress would hold hearings, and all the economists would come and say, yeah, yeah, deregulation makes sense. Of course, they didn't know the banks were paying those economists, put that aside. Um, but that's what the economists said, that's what they did. And it, and it also turned out to benefit them in the, in the sense they got ton, millions of, they got you know, billions, literally, of lobbying and campaign funds. The really terrifying thing is after 2008, after we have the biggest crisis since the Depression, after everybody independent of this says, hey, this architecture of regulation is a significant cause of this crisis. People on the left and the right, Richard Posner writes two books where he ties it to this regulatory structure. After the dean of deregulation, Alan Greenspan, testifies to Congress he was mistaken about what the banks would do in this context, thinking they would act in the public interest rather than just try to get as much as they could, as quickly as they could. After all of that, the banks still have the power to blackmail Congress, Democrats and Republicans, into passing the weakest kind of, quote, reform bill that leaves the fundamental structural flaw in place, which is, if the banks were too big to fail before, they are only bigger right now than they were before. And they are, you know, many people believe we are at more of a risk right now of the same kind of catastrophe than we were in 2006. And so you think, this is the first time in the history of America where we've had an economic collapse and the government hasn't tried to address the collapse by changing the regulations that they believe led to the collapse. The first time they've had enough power to basically stave off that kind of re-regulation. And you think, you know, what is a better evidence of the corruption of the system than that alone? That alone, I think, is the case. Which is why I think the Occupy Wall Street movement is so brilliant to start by occupying Wall Street. It's not that the Wall Street people are rich. You know, Silicon Valley is rich, but you couldn't have imagined Occupy Silicon Valley or Occupy One Infinity Way, like that's Steve Jobs. You, have to, you know, just, it just wouldn't sing. But Occupy Wall Street makes sense because it's not about being rich. It's about being rich through this corruption, this corruption precisely. So Occupy Wall Street, then Occupy K Street, and then we can begin to build a movement that gets people to recognize what really is at stake here. Let me, let me ask you about your, I've got two more things I want to get to the solution to. Um, your personal journey. And you clerked uh, for Judge Posner and then for Justice Scalia. And many would think from that that you had some, you, you were basically very sympathetic uh, where you were or not, but, I, but then you voted for President Obama. And I, what I hear is you're a little disillusioned with both sides. Yeah, so it's worse than that, right? Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Maybe, I, I, I understand. I was, the, uh, <laughs> I was the youngest member of a delegation in the 1980 Republican Convention. Um, uh, you, were a member, you were a member of a delegation? That I was a member of the Pennsylvania delegation in 1980. I ran in the 17th district. I was elected. I went there, chanted for Reagan, and you know, Reagan was our nominee. Okay. Um, you and I were both there. Uh, okay. Um, you wouldn't talk to me then, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, you know, when I clerked for Scalia, actually, Scalia hired me as a liberal. So there wasn't a change there. It was before. There was a significant change. But yes, absolutely, I'm disillusioned with both sides. And disillusioned with Obama primarily because, you know, he was a colleague of mine in Chicago. I was an admirer of him. I supported every one of his campaigns. But the only reason to support Obama over Hillary Clinton was that he said his job was to take up the fight to change the way Washington works. Repeatedly, he said, this is why I am running. Because if we don't change the way Washington works, fix the power of these lobbyists, then we're not going to solve any problem. He said everything more poetically than these 10,000 pages try to argue, but that was why he was the candidate, in my view, right? And that's why I was so keen to see him win. And then he won, and he just put down the Obama playbook and picked up the Hillary Clinton playbook. And he ran his administration exactly how Hillary Clinton would have met, run the administration. And I had this amazing kind of Marshall McLuhan moment in July. I finished the book and I was Aspen and um, sitting there having breakfast and David Axelrod sits down next to me. And I look over and I say, wow, um, uh, so let me just ask you, uh, what was the plan? You know, what was the plan? You know, this was the whole campaign. How are we gonna change the way Washington works? What were the first three steps that you were gonna, I mean, obviously you didn't implement the plan, but okay, what was the plan? it's clear there was no plan. There was no idea how they were gonna do it. And you know, he said, oh, you have to understand, we had a crisis. I said, no, 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 no. Crisis was the opportunity. You had a super majority in Congress. You had God, a man who could walk on water for a president, and you had a crisis. These were the three things you needed to be able to bring about this change. And you know, fumble, fumble, and then he said, you know, I remember 
early in the administration, the president got his first budget. There were 7,000 earmarks. And the president said, I'm going to veto this. And his Hill lobbyist said, no, 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 you can't veto this bill. Right. And you know, you kind of think, my God, if he had vetoed that bill, he yep. would have been the Tea Party. He would have been the movement about reform. It would have begun this fight, not a fight against Republicans, yeah. because you got to remember, 40% of Americans are Republican. It would have been a fight against yeah. Congress, and yeah. nobody loves Congress. So right. that would have been a fight he could have won, not a fight against the That's Republicans. It was very similar to Jimmy Carter and Water Projects. Absolutely. Yeah, and very interesting. Um, there's a larger question here that arises, to go back to one of your points about Students here, we train them up, go to Wall Street, $180,000 on the way to 500. How much are the rest of us dependent you know, in, in ways upon flows of money? You know, we go to donors, ask them to do things for the university. We go off and do things at the university. NGOs go off and do those things. Sort of, you know, how, isn't this bigger than Congress? Absolutely. So the life at the center, uh, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. We run a lab. It's a five-year research project about what we call institutional corruption. Mm -hmm. Dependency corruption is one particular example, and Congress is just one part of it. You know, yeah. So think about academics who take money to give public testimony. Yeah. Think about doctors sitting on drug panels that review drugs. Mm -hmm. Those are all legal, completely ethical, as long as you disclose them. But for the same reason, they plausibly create skepticism, mistrust, lack of trust about what in fact is being said by these institutions. Um, so, you know, when you look at parents who say, I'm not going to vaccinate my kids, and you ask them why, and a significant number of them say, well, because those doctors who tell me it's safe, they're just in the pocket of the drug companies, I think that's bullshit. That's not why the doctors say that. But if the public thinks that, and they choose not to vaccinate yeah. their kids because of that, you know, we have the rise of measles and all sorts of diseases which we should have eradicated because of that lack of trust. So, yeah. so we're, trying, we're working in a lot of contexts, the financial services sector, accounting, um, uh, auditing, one of, the, uh, one of our big work around auditing right now, to, to try to think about what are the conditions in which we can create institutions that give the public a reason to trust them um, uh, and recognize the way in which our institutions have frittered away their entitlement to be trusted because of the seduction of these other influences. That yeah, I, 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 just, I will confess up front um, that uh, you know, I, I, I uh, have been on the public lecture circuit for a number of years. I have a contract with CNN. And we've wrestled with the question of if you're out and making public comment and you're speaking to various groups, you know, what, how do you deal with that? And in this case, you know, I send them a list and if we agree that something looks like a conflict, then I give the money to charity. I've got a fund set up just to mm -hmm. send it to, but it still weighs on me, especially after I was reading your book, I had to think about you know, how do I, you know, how do I, how, how should I think about this? Should I change what I do? I, I'm not sure. I'm pretty far along in this. You know, well, it's, it's, these are not, but I mean, I think, I think to some extent we all become, or to a, more, more than we'd like to realize or, or acknowledge, we become dependent upon yes. sources of money or income that are really become pretty vital to our lives. I completely agree. And, uh, there are many other people I wish would worry about this before you do. Um, uh, you know, I'm glad you're worrying about it, but, I, but there are many more uh, It's not that I've done much about it, but I do, I, you know, I, uh, but I do, I, I mean, I acknowledge it, it's an issue because I do think that, especially uh, among people who are purposely to be affluent, there is money coming in from a variety of things that you sort of become dependent on the system. Absolutely, absolutely. And, it's, uh, and, and that's true of people in a lot of institutions that I yeah. know today. Yeah which is why this is a very uncomfortable thing to talk about, and which is why at the very beginning of the book, yeah. I want to say, look, there's a difference between evil people and good people. And I'm not talking about evil people in this book. I'm talking about good people. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about people like us. And it's for exactly this reason. People like us, it's not just congressmen who suffer mm -hmm. this kind of corruption, this kind of temptation, this kind of, it's all of us. We all live in systems that are constantly forcing us to make ethical judgments about what kind of relationship is appropriate, given who I want to be. You know, if I want to be just a paid spokesman for, you know, one inter industry, that's fine. I can be a lobbyist right. for that industry. Right. But if I want to be something that pretends that you're not just a paid sp spokesman right. um, and is something other than a paid spokesman, 
then you've got to worry about exactly what is the relationship you have to these interests. So it, it seems to me the solutions then lie both in institutional changes and in cultural changes. Yeah. And talk us through a little bit, and then we'll open this up. Well, the institutional change in the context of Congress, if the problem is Congress follows the funders and the funders are not the people, we need changes to make the funders the people. So there are a lot of small dollar funded campaign systems out there. The one that I propose in the book basically goes like this. Every voter contributes at least $50 to the federal treasury. So let's take that first $50 and rebate it in the form of a democracy voucher. And with that democracy voucher, you can give that voucher to any candidate for Congress as long as that candidate agrees the source of his or her funds will be only vouchers plus contributions of up to $100. Steal that from Buddy Romer. So $100 plus the vouchers. So if you had $50 per voter, that's $6 billion. That's about two and a half times the total amount raised and spent in the last congressional election. And if you had a Congress where the vast majority had opted into this way of funding their elections, then whatever reason there was to, the, to disagree with what they did, maybe they're too liberal, maybe they're too conservative, we wouldn't believe it was the money. You know? And that would be the beginnings of making it possible for us to have confidence in that institution again. So I think a, you know, whether it's this particular version or another sort of small dollar funded version, it's not hard to see how, what the alternative would be that would remove the cynical reasons we have for distrusting what they're doing. The impossible thing is to imagine the political movement that brings it about. Because if you've got um, a Congress eager to stay in Congress, they know how to win under the system they have right now, and they want to retire to this wealthy life as a lobbyist, they're not about to change the system for funding their elections. And so mm -hmm. what do we do on the outside? How much money would it bring into a presidential campaign by your estimate? Well, I, this is just about Congress. I think there should be a similar thing for, Cong for the president. I haven't tried to figure out what yeah, the numbers well, should be. Well, what we found is that people take public funding, John McCain. Yeah. took public funding. Barack Obama decided not to take public funding. He wiped him out. Yeah. Obama but, wiped him out. But the difference between the systems is that that public funding system is basically the government deciding how much money you get. Yeah, right. And this is the public funding system where the people decide by basically voting with their vouchers as well as on right. election day voting with their dollars. What their would you do culturally to change things? I think we have to create a, a way of talking about ethics that doesn't require that we call someone evil. You know, we have to recognize there's a way of being respectful, but saying you need to think about what is the appropriate way for you to behave, you know, and, and without us, you know, vilifying in this context. Because, and this is what professions did, you know, professional organizations like lawyers um, get together and sort of say, well, what are the rules for our profession to sort of say, this is what a honorable, you know, honorable lawyer, honorable journalist, honorable, uh, uh, person in the medical profession would do. And we need more of those types of institutions to sort of give us a way to signal what right behaving is without pretending that, you know, somebody who decides to take money in a certain way in the context of his work is the same as somebody who fudges results on a scientific paper. Terrific. Let's open this up. Who would like to ask a question here, please? If you'd stand. Oh, they actually have to go to the mics. Oh, you have to go to a mic? There are mics. There's one mic, sides. two mics. But if you get to a mic, you'll have a question. You have the first question. OK, in the book, you talked about uh, holding a constitutional convention, which you haven't talked about at all today. Uh, and you so said that maybe a good way to get started would be to hold uh, citizens' conventions, not among professional uh, politicians at the state level. But instead of just talking about constitutional change, why don't we talk about secession? Um, there are already nascent uh, secessionist movements uh, in different parts of the state, which would allow more direct democracy at home, and more importantly, or equally importantly, it would prevent any of them from becoming international hegemons, which would continue to carry out the cr terrible crimes of state that we've been carrying out uh, for the last 50 years. So isn't secession another option we can discuss among uh, people that are more concerned about returning government to the people? Well, I, I might agree about some of the, quote, crimes. Um, but I'm not, I don't favor secession, no. I, I think it's, there is secession, is that what I heard? Yeah, secession. Um, you and Rick Perry, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I don't favor it because I think there are really important national problems we have to solve as a nation. Like global warming is not gonna be addressed by Cambridge figuring out you know, what its global warming policy is gonna be. It's only gonna be addressed if the United States of America figures out its global warming policy. So we gotta figure out a way to make the United States of America able to right, make the right decisions. Uh, and then, you know, I let's have a conversation later about whether we still need to think about how to make it smaller or less militarily involved. Please. In Congress, 
the re-election rate for incumbents is still rather high. Doesn't that suggest that the electorate does not consider corruption an electoral issue or in fact favors it? What basis is there to believe that Congress can even be trusted in the way that you've talked about here tonight? Okay, so the election rate is really high. The reasons for the election rate being high might be because people love Congress or because most seats are safe and there isn't much of a fight in the primary because if you've got a war chest of $5 million, who's going to take you on? I favor the latter more than the former. But even if you think it's the former, we should distinguish between thinking your congressperson is great and thinking Congress is great. Many people like their congressperson, they don't like Congress. How could that be? Well, I think part of the reason is exactly what I'm talking about. You meet your congressperson, you say, it's a pretty decent person, hardworking, you know, I think. But, but that's because the kind of thing I'm talking about that people observe on the, on, the, on the macro level is not bad people, it's good people. Good people operating a system nobody can trust because, they, again, they think overwhelmingly, three-fourths or two-thirds, depending on which party, money buys results in Congress. Now, the hard question is, how do I show or how do I assert that in fact, if you didn't have that cynical assumption into everything they did, you'd have a reason to, to think more highly of them. Uh, I, we don't have any good you know, double-blind test to show that. Um, what we do have is different points in our history where people would not have assumed that it was money driving every single decision, where you could see Congress working together on critical issues like, uh, you know, that, that made you think, well, maybe it's something more than the money that's going on here. And, 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 and you know, my view is let's try, because if we don't try, we're really screwed. Right? You know, we don't have a choice about whether to solve the problems we've got here. We've got to figure out how to solve them. And in an institution that gets 9% of the public uh, approval, I think this is the first thing we've got to worry about. Uh, my, my, my experience has been that not only members of Congress are highly frustrated by this system, oh, yeah. they hate all the fundraising, and indeed lobbyists hate it. Because yeah, the, the lobbyists think it's a form of a stick up. You know, if you want to come see me, you first got to pay at the door. And, and they, there's a lot of, everybody feels caught in something that's not working. Please. Thank you very much for your time. I wanted to ask uh, it seems a lot of discussions moved from, you know, disillusionment at uh, the high level, highest levels and towards more like local changes. Could you talk more about how you can, about possible institutional and cultural changes at the local government and state government level that could catalyze, you know, more civic activism? So I would love to see more of that. I had a, I was on a radio show today with an, a Republican state legislator from New Hampshire called. New Hampshire has a 400 person house, 400 state legislators. Um, and he says, there's no, you know, I mean, he, he completely agreed with the corruption claim at bigger governments, but he said, in our government, you know, this is a hundred dollar a year job. Um, nobody's lobbying us to do anything. We just represent our people, you know, it's our neighborhood. And, and, and so, you know, he said it's a much better system at that kind of level. Um, and, and it might be, and it might be that what you want to do is move more government to the states and local level because of that. But, uh, but you know, uh, Steve Martin used to tell a joke, he said, um, it's not, I'm not going to tell it very well. Maybe Jay-Z could tell this joke, but because uh, he's so good at that. But um, I, he used to say, you know, how do you get a million dollars and pay no taxes? First, get a million dollars. Then, pay no taxes, right? So it's like, that, <laughs> so people who argue that we ought to be moving stuff to the local level are, are assuming the hardest part of the problem, which is, how do you get Congress to allow you to do that if Congress has an interest in keeping as much control over everything that it can? But that's not to say that local communities can't rescue themselves. Yes, that's right. And, and, and start a wave of reforms. I was just in New Orleans, and I can tell you, there's something going on there that's very, very impressive and give you some sense of hope. Let's go back over here. I was deeply inspired by your book, and, and I ask you this as a 1L here at Harvard. What can we as lawyers or aspiring lawyers, or what role can we play in this? Yeah, so the frustrating thing is that there's not an Amazon one-click solution here, <laughs> right? And, and, and so I think we're at a stage where we've got a lot of work to educate people to get them to connect the dots, get them to see why this is, you know, my sacred text is Thoreau, for every thousand hacking at the branches of evil, there's one striking at the root. We got to get them to understand the root and connect it to the issues they care about. So they care about global warming, get them to see global warming is the problem it is because of this problem. Healthcare, small, simpler taxes, all the issues we've been talking about. 
Now, how do you educate them? Well, you know, we actually have a group called Root Strikers, appropriately enough. Strike at the root. Root Strikers, get it? It's kind of cute. Um, <laughs> um, and Root Strikers is launching into this stage where we take it as our job to go out and help educate in these contexts. So we want to do teach-ins at the Occupy movements to sort of get the Occupy movements to sort of recognize exactly the point that we were talking about, that, you know, what you can really be focusing on here is this corrupting influence as a way to get and mobilize in a, in a broader range of people. But not just Occupy movements, you know, people having house parties, people sort of at dinner, people like taking it on themselves to go out and to educate and connect the dots for people. And something as trivial as, you know, hashtag root striker, um, every time you see a story um, that is a story about money and politics, every single level of it. So we had the biggest uh, root striker story was about at some a school board level, this guy, this woman, this story about how my wife ran against uh, George W. Bush um, for school board, which it wasn't really George W. Bush, it was just literally hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent in a local school board election in the context of deciding some very heightened uh, politically polarized issue. So I think we've got to do really hard political work of just helping America to understand this. That's the first stage. And once we have most Americans who recognize this is the issue, then we're ripe for movements that are saying, okay, fine, now we're gonna talk about how we're gonna get money out. It sounds very much like John Gardner at Common Cause. Yeah, that's exactly it. Right. Please. Uh, yeah, just speaking to the education project, I wonder how either of you see the role or dynamics around journalism, because it seems as though investigative journalism, you could you know, burn through a lot of young careers tracing money, um, and what, what are the dynamics that have prevented that from happening? Yeah, well, there used to be investigative journalism. Um, then the market structure of journalism changed, and it's very few institutions that can really afford investigative journalism. Uh, and the harder part is the kind of investigative journalism that they can afford turns out to be the kind of sexy corruption stories. Um, and it's harder to do investigative journalism around the kind of stuff that I'm talking about right here. I mean, when I started to write this book, Everybody I talked to about the book said, you've got to tell a story about all these corrupt and evil people like trying to take as much money as they can for themselves. And my response was, well, what if it's not true? <laughs> what if that's just not the case? Well, nobody will buy the book then. Okay, well, you know, here's our problem. If we can't talk about what's true, even though it is much more destructive than the bribery stuff, then how are we going to get people to understand this issue and do something about it? Um, I have a quip in the book, that for Teachout, who teaches at Fordham said, what we need is more bribery, less corruption, right? So, um, <laughs> because, yeah. you know, the bribery stuff, that was just about people getting rich. You know, Randy Duke Cunningham, it was just about how to feed his sort of obsessions, right? It didn't really screw up the nation, but Wall Street, plain, in plain sight, correct, that really, the cost of Wall Street alone dwarf all of the corruption that we're talking about in this other way, so. Yeah. Well, there is such a thing, though, as, as investigatory research, which is what he's yeah. engaged in. And there's also, I think, well, another hope in that area is there are some uh, NGOs that are coming forward. ProPublica yes. now has been formed. A fellow named Paul Steiger used to be out of the Wall Street Journal. I happen to be a personal friend. He, he raised a lot of money for this, and they won two Pulitzers yeah. here in the last two or three years. They, they employ, employ a whole lot of investigative journalists and then partner up with a, with a news organization. Uh, and they've done some really, really interesting work with it. Please. There are some people who would like to amend the U.S. Constitution to, to revoke corporate personhood and basically make it clear that the you know, Bill of Rights, 14th Amendment, and so on are only there to protect the rights of, per, of humans and not of corporations. How far would that go toward addressing the problem you're bringing up? Yeah, so I'm always so torn about this issue because on the one hand, it really gets people going. And as, you know, a budding revolutionary. I love the idea of people getting going. I love the excitement. But on the other hand, it's a complete, I think it's a complete non-issue, complete non-issue. Um, you know, so if we built a reform movement and achieved the objectives of reversing Citizens United or um, declaring corporations not persons, we would have achieved nothing, <laughs> right? Because, you know, people talk as if the problem of democracy was created on January 21st, 2010, when the Supreme Court decided Citizens United. You know, our democracy was already broken on January 20th, 2010, the day before they decided Citizens United, long before there was any of the stuff tied to the corporate personhood. So I would say I'm okay if you need it to add element four to an amendment to the Constitution that says there is no corporate personhood, you know, or there's no constitutional rights that you get, unalienable rights by virtue of being a corporation. Well, I'd be happy with that. That's fine. 
Just make that number four. What, what are one, two, three? One, two, and three are number one, Congress must publicly fund public elections. Number two, I think we should limit contributions, not ban them the way uh, like Dylan Radigan wants, but limit them. And I would say take Buddy's number, $100. Number three, Congress has got to have the power to limit but not to ban independent expenditures. So I think every entity ought to have a right to participate in the political process in saying their views, dolphins or corporations or anybody. Um, but they cannot dominate the system so that you have candidates not only shape-shifting to get contributions, but shape-shifting to get the right kind of independent expenditures in their race. So those three elements would radically change the way this democracy functions. And if you want to add the corporate personhood as number four on that, okay, fine. But to make it number one and to build a movement around that just seems to me just so classically leftist, self-defeating, hopeless. Um, and maybe it's in our nature, but that's just what it feels like to me. Well, good. Last question. Yep. Uh, what, what would you think about simply uh, changing the system so that uh, Congress, everybody in Congress gets a six-year term, the president too for that matter, and that's it. It eliminates uh, all that time and energy that go into getting reelected every few years and the corruption that goes along with having to raise the money to do that. Yeah, so I used to be a believer in term limits, and then I lived in California for nine years um, and recognized from the California example that it turns out to be a good idea with really bad unintended consequences. And the bad unintended consequences are that the only people who know how to do anything in Sacramento are the lobbyists, because all of the representatives are term limited, they have to move through the system so quickly, they never become expert in running government, so they, every time we want to do anything, they just pick up the phone and say to a lobbyist, what do I do? How do I do this? So it has the unintended consequence of increasing the power of lobbyists inside the system rather than creating really independent representatives. So I, my own view is now, I don't think it's a bad thing to have representatives who want to make their life public service. And they, you know, like my representative in California was Tom Lantos you know, who never wanted to be a president, couldn't be a president, didn't want to be a senator, just wanted to be a public servant, and he was for, you know, a million years of his life, his long life. Um, and people liked him and respected him for that. And, and I think as long as he didn't have to, you could run your campaigns without selling your soul to the people who have to fund you, it's fine to give the people a chance to, to have people for as long as they want. Uh, Ma'am, we, we, we had called last question. If you want to be very brief. This is just a response to your last comment that um, you had four, uh, three things and then the fourth would be the amendment. But the third thing you mentioned was to limit independent expenditures. And I thought that the Citizens United ruling exactly prohibited that or said that that was not possible due to free speech. And so how would you achieve number three yeah. without number four? Yeah, no, so um, two things. First, what I'm talking about is a constitutional amendment. So the constitutional amendment would say you can limit independent expenditures. So the First Amendment, the interpretation of the First Amendment says you have a constitutional right to independent expenditures would be changed. That's just would achieve that. But the, third, the second thing, which is really important, is Citizens United, said, Citizens United says nothing about hanging this decision on the status of corporations as being persons. That's not why the decision was written the way it was. What the decision says is this is a regulation of political speech the First Amendment forbids Congress from regulating political speech. Therefore, the question is whether Congress has a compelling interest for regulating this political speech. Because the court has a very narrow conception of corruption, there was no compelling interest, end of case. There's no step in the reasoning that said, because corporations are persons, they therefore have a First Amendment right. They didn't even get to that question. It was just the status of uh, a speech. So my point is, if we have an amendment that says Congress has the power to limit independent expenditures, even if the corporation is a person, Congress would have that power. Oh, so the number three was an amendment. All, all one, two, and three are amendments. All four are amendments. Oh, okay. It's a four-part okay. amendment. Okay. I, I can hand you a packet that has the four-part amendment. <laughs> we already written it. Um, yeah. The amendment wasn't needed, but that's, that's what you Absolutely. want in the amendment. Okay. Yes, all three. Well, Jonathan is here. Uh, I can just tell you that read the book. It's, it's, no, no, buy the book. Really no, buy, buy the, the book. book. <laughs> Aha, that's a, a constructive amendment. <laughs> amendment number five. The, uh, uh, the book is as good as the presentation. And I think we're all indebted to you for the presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Very much.